What's up, everyone? Back for another episode of Locked On Bucks to start a new week. And unfortunately for Milwaukee, there's been three losses in a row. We haven't had to discuss three losses in a row for quite a while, but I'm here. We're going to talk about Bucks and Spurs. And more importantly, we're going to talk about uh, Milwaukee and Utah and what, what to make of the start of the season. Uh, how are the Bucks going to approach these next few weeks? Because they're about to head out on the road with a significant a trip on the road. We spoke previously about uh, their road-heavy schedule to start the season, so there's plenty to discuss. So let's get into it. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked on Bucks. I'm your host, Kane Pittman. You can see and hear me on this show daily, wherever you get your podcasts or now on YouTube. Uh, you can also find my words over at ESPN and NBA Australia. As always, we thank you for making Locked on Bucks your first listen Monday to Friday and the odd, the odd weekend podcast. But there was no weekend podcast this week because this Spurs game that we're going to get into was uh, not fun at all. And then today, uh, as I record this, just in the last hour or so, we've seen the Bucks go down to the Jazz. So riding solo today, Frank's actually in Houston with some family right now, and he is watching the baseball. I mean, if you listen, the Bucks are three and four on the season now. At times, you're like, okay, they've been a little bit lackadaisical to start the season. Obviously, there's been some injuries, but they're not the only ones sometimes that haven't had the energy. Frank couldn't even bring himself two games to discuss, couldn't even bring himself uh, to jump on the podcast because he's watching baseball, of all things. Absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, that's fine. We've got plenty of stuff to get through today, as I mentioned at the top. So the Bucks lost to the Spurs, 102-93. Uh, uh, speaking of Frank, he tweeted during this game that, this game felt like it was on muscle relaxers, and I would agree. It was a a very difficult game to watch. Yeah, the Bucks were, again, I guess, scrappy defensively, but their three-point shooting has been a talking point to start the season. There's no doubt about that. And this was another game, and it's not the first time, and there were certainly stretches in this game today that we watched against Utah as well where they just haven't been able to capitalize on the momentum swinging shot or the big three that's going to get them back into these games. As I mentioned, the Bucks are three and four on the season. They haven't been under 500 since they started last season two and three. I believe the third loss there was the second game against Miami the night before they broke the three-point shooting record there. So basically for today's show, I've got some numbers based on this season so far, last season, some interesting stuff. And then we'll uh, move ahead and talk about these injuries because, uh, I mean, it just continues to mount. And tonight uh, didn't get much better for the Bucks. More players injured, more players out of the lineup. And it's uh, it's quite extraordinary. I can't really remember seeing anything like it from the Bucks' point of view where it was this early in the season. It wasn't late in the season where guys are resting or whatever. We've seen, obviously, some strange games from time to time. But this uh, has been absurd. So... Tonight's game against Utah, I would call this, if the Bucs were going to beat a Utah team, yes, it was at five-set forum, but if you just look at the players that were on the court, Utah was basically at full strength. When I mentioned that there was a couple of more injuries, the Bucs lost Chris Middleton in the pregame to illness. Now, it's Bud confirmed postgame, jumped off the call there, and he said that it wasn't COVID. Before the game, he sort of said that uh, he didn't think it was a COVID-related illness. But anyway, he did confirm after the game that it's not COVID, so he was just feeling ill. Funnily enough, I was watching the game against San Antonio yesterday, and we know from time to time, Chris Milton, he, the way he moves, he moves slow. And uh, I thought defensively, he just looked exhausted in yesterday's game. Again, that's not potentially anything new for Chris Milton, but I almost wasn't surprised when he pulled out of today's game um, with illness because he looked a, a little bit off in that game against San Antonio. So Middleton's out. Uh, during the game, you lose Rodney Hood to a hand contusion. Uh, apparently, there was an x-ray there. It was inconclusive, so they obviously wanted to uh, be cautious with that and didn't want to put him back out there, so they'll get another scan tomorrow. The Bucks heading to Detroit to play the Pistons in a couple of days' time. So 
Rodney Hood's obviously been injury prone, but he came back. He hit a couple of shots. You just want to see him get a bit of a good run at it here and get some minutes. But he was out of the lineup. It probably seems unlikely that he's going to play in this game against Detroit. As far as the other guys, Brooke Lopez, there's still no timeline. I mean, Bud is being asked about Brooke Lopez, asked for any updates. From what it sounds like, he's doing no basketball activity at all at the moment. He's in some g- in the gym doing some rehab. Uh, but it would you would have to assume that Brook Lopez is still a little way away, maybe a couple of weeks. I mean, he, he hasn't even been on the court doing basketball stuff, which is obviously a little bit concerning. Drew Holiday, on the other hand, uh, he's a chance to play against Detroit. He did some basketball stuff in practice uh, early in the morning uh, prior to the Utah game, so Bud didn't completely rule him out of that game. The Bucks have a couple of days off after uh, that game against Detroit, so I would probably still be just leaning towards him potentially coming back for a game against the New York Knicks later this week. But that's that's the injury update. And with all that considered, the Bucks rolled out a starting lineup with George Hill, Grayson Allen, Pat Connaughton, Thanasis and Giannis. I think I heard Jim Olszewski in the post-game media conference say that they've already had over 100 different lineup combinations through seven games, which I'm not. it's not exactly a stat that I track but it feels like that is an incredible amount of lineups to have had at this point in the season. It certainly feels that way anyway. And despite that, this game against Utah tonight, I really thought that the Bucs competed. I thought it was a pretty enjoyable game to watch. I mean, obviously frustrating on the offensive end, but the way they were able to battle, I thought was pretty good. And a lot of the numbers looked nice for the Bucs. We looked points in the paint. Milwaukee, despite the fact that Utah obviously have Rudy Gobert, they have... Uh, triple penetration guys with Donovan Mitchell and Jordan Clarkson. The Bucks still outscored Utah in the paint 44 to 42. And I thought, again, the only way that they could keep, stay in this game or keep in this game was in all the hustle stats and the offensive rebounds. And you have a guy like Thanasis in the starting lineup that's just going to throw his body around all over the place, potentially get some back taps, collect some of those offensive rebounds. The Bucks tied a season high with 13 off- offensive rebounds uh, for the game. The second chance points were 18 to 8. The fast break points were 20 to 11. Again, some of those came off turnovers. The Nassus was pretty critical to that. I'm going to speak about that a little bit later in the podcast here. But yeah, I mean, for the most part, a lot of the numbers looked pretty nice. Again, if you're Milwaukee, and this is this has actually been a trend right across the entire league so far this year. Three-point shooting has been down. But as I look at the box score here, Milwaukee three-point shooting. 12 for 41. So they're sub 30% again, not for the first time this year. It feels like almost every single night they're sub 30%, but it is a problem. It's not all that surprising that it happened on the second night of a back-to-back. Again, we've already spoke about it. There's no Lopez, there's no Middleton, there's no Holiday. So you've got some shooters obviously out of the lineup, but you look at some of the guys out here, Pat Connaughton, one for five. He's really started to cool off over the last couple of weeks. Jordan War was 0 for 2. Giannis took up took 11. Career high, three-point attempts is 12. He did that against Brooklyn last year. So he was three for 11. So again, maybe that was the back-to-back. I certainly suspect that the back-to-back was the cause of Giannis jacking up all those jump shots, particularly early in the game. Of course, maybe some of it's the fact that Rudy Gobert is there and it was so easy to load up on Giannis because there was no real other threats offensively to, to penetrate, to create. It was Giannis or nothing. So maybe... It was just too difficult for him to get to his spots. And so he settled for those threes. I'm not sure if that's that's the reason. Giannis didn't speak after the game, but it would certainly make sense when more than half of his temps come from beyond the three-point line. And then there was more re- mid-range jump shots in there as well. So an interesting box score for Giannis in this one. Of course, as usual, he still put up pretty good numbers, 25 points, seven rebounds, six assists, two steals, two blocks. So he filled the stat sheet. Another guy that does look... To continue to impress as the season moves on is Grayson Allen. So we will talk about Grayson Allen a little bit more as this show goes on as well. But first, I want to talk about Indeed. Indeed is a hiring partner that gets you what you really want, a list of quality candidates as fast as possible because you can do it all, attract, interview, and hire all at Indeed. Indeed is unbelievably powerful hiring partner. Uh, again, as I said, you can you, it's all three. It's all in the one place. You can attract, you can interview, you can hire, you can do it all. So don't struggle on your own to find quality candidates. Indeed can help you hire the right people right now. With Instant Match, 
As soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description, and you can even invite uh, invite them to apply the right way. So get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash locked on. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash locked on. Indeed.com slash locked on. Offer valid through December 31st. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire. You need Indeed. And I've got another situation for you because I know that this is going to sound familiar. You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows. You're watching sports highlights on your phone and you've got your neighbor's best friends log in for the good stuff. And honestly, tonight might be the perfect example of this. You've got World Series going on right now. You've got Sunday Night Football going on right now. You're trying to watch the Milwaukee Bucks game. It's it's difficult to get all this stuff together, but Direct TV Stream makes it easy. It brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite shows, movies, uh, and uh, shows. What did I say? Your favorite sports movies and shows all in the one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there's no annual contract, so get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com, compatible device required content varies by package all right let's talk defense a little bit here as we keep the show going so tonight was interesting against utah and and i think overall if you just compare the numbers from last season to this year it's interesting to see where the nba is trending so we've spoke about the buck struggles certainly shooting the ball from three-point land uh, overall i I believe I saw a stat today that said that the three-point percentage across the league is down to a low that was last or the lowest point in the last decade, which we've spoken about. What, what's the impact of this? Is it the crowds coming back to the arena and all of a sudden you're not in this perfect gym setting, dead quiet, sight lines perhaps are a little more muddy than they were when there was empty arenas and tops behind the basket? Is it the new ball? Wilson. Wilson comes on board. And the shooting goes down. I remember a few years ago when they brought in that synthetic ball that didn't last too long at all because the players hate it. I actually haven't heard too many complaints about the ball, but maybe it, you know, maybe it's having an impact. That's one other thing that has uh, actually changed when it's coming into the game. But if you look at the the defensive numbers, particularly or specifically with the Bucks, so in the 2020-21 season, remember the Bucks were 46 and 26 on their way to a title. They were the ninth ranked defense with a defensive rating of 110.7. Right now, their defensive rating through seven games is actually 109.1. So the defense, despite the fact Brook Lopez has hardly played, despite the fact that Drew Holiday has hardly played, despite the fact that they're using all these different lineups and different uh, players on the court and, and guys that have never played together and they're trying different things, which we'll get into in a little bit here, the defense is one point better per 100 possessions this year to last year, which is extraordinary to think about. The reason that they're three and four and they're not yeah, five and two, six and one maybe when you consider that this Utah game was probably winnable in the situation. You didn't expect that they were going to win, but when you get to the fourth quarter, you're down by a couple of points, you're in it. It was the same against the Spurs in the game yesterday as well, but the offense is the problem. And, and, and this shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, we're all watching this team. We're seeing the lack of creators. Obviously, the three-point shooting isn't helping, but they just don't have enough guys out there that are talented to score. I thought that they got a nice boost from Bobby Portis that came back into the lineup tonight. But the offense, last year, fifth ranked, 116.5 offensive rating. So far this season, it's at uh, 106. So they've dropped 10 points per 100 possessions. Again, offenses are down across the league because the the, the crazy thing about these stats is Despite the Bucks' defense being better than it was last year, they've got they've dropped from ninth to the twenty-first ranked defense. Offensively, they were fifth, but they, they've got a middle of the pack offense right now. It's, it's one hundred six, which is well down on where it was last year. But they're fourteenth league wide at the moment. Despite the fact we're watching the games, we're seeing that the offense is a is a major problem for this team as they wait for some of these bodies to get back. They tried some interesting stuff tonight. When you have Rudy Gobert out there and you don't really have a matchup for Rudy, of course, Giannis has defended him in the past. He had another huge block on him. But a lot of the times he's going to get caught, roll into the basket, and you're going to have to rely on on, on weak side help to, to try and cut off those rolls. We saw that a lot. Pat Connaughton was one guy that was doing that a lot. We've seen George Hill 
be a guy that's been on that on that back line, which is extraordinary to think about. But that that's the way that the Bucks have been uh, been forced to to run this defense a little bit. But probably the most interesting thing tonight was the way Thanasis was the blitzing the pick and roll coverage. And I I tweeted about it late in the game because it was obviously prominent late in the game. There was possession after possession after possession as the Bucks were trying to get back into this game. Thanasis would just uh, blitz the, the ball handler as he came around the screen, try and get a steal. And he did a couple of times. He got a couple of steals that resulted in easy transition buckets where he could just go down the floor and get a dunk. But it's not something that we've seen a lot of. And so I, I didn't know whether Thanasis was just like freestyling out there and doing his own thing. Bud was asked about it by Eric Name in the post game, and Bud kind of acknowledged the fact that they got to try some different things because it's it's unique personnel that they got out on the floor. And uh, he, the expression that Bud used when describing Thanasis, which I think was perfect, he said that yeah, we we turned Thanasis loose, <laughs> and and I thought, I mean, it's true because he was he was a madman out there. And you need to have a unique skill set to be able to do that. Ben Thanasis does have it because he's got the energy. Uh, he's got the quickness. There's no doubt about that to kind of surprise the ball handler. And you don't see a lot of this around the league uh, these days. Certainly, it, it doesn't happen because, and this happened a couple of times to the Bucks because if you don't execute that steal, then you're in a terrible position. And it, for for Donovan Mitchell or Jordan Clarkson, whoever it was, it was an easy pass to the roll big, whether it was Rudy Gobert, he's rolling to the basket. And then even if you you have bodies that recover and jump on Rudy Gobert, then it's an easy kick out pass to the corner and you're going to get a wide open three. So that's the reason why teams don't do it a lot. If you remember, even back to the Jason Kidd days, it wasn't necessarily that aggressive and they, they would try different things in pick and roll coverage, but it was always one pass, open three. And that's why they got torched, particularly in the corners. And that's why the Bucs haven't given away a lot of corner threes since Bud came in, because they're not really aggressive when it comes to the pick and roll defense. We saw it a little bit tonight. I thought it was fine for shock value. Again, if you're going to have some someone do that, Thanasis might be the perfect man to do it. So, yeah, it was just interesting to watch. And honestly, down the stretch, again, they, they were able to get stops. You know, I thought it was pretty impactful. And I thought overall that Thanasis had a pretty good game. Probably at times, he, he tries to do a little bit too much offensively. I mean, there was a couple of times there where I was like, all right, dude, we need you to stop trying to score over Rudy Gobert. It didn't go well for him. But overall, I don't think you could fault his game altogether. He did pick up three steals, 10 points, nine rebounds, uh, had three assists as well there. And, you know, five for 15 from the field. Again, a little bit out of control when he's going to the basket. And, you know, he got up a couple of threes as well. But, you know, this was a game where the Bucs were going to have to win with hustle. That was the only way they were going to keep themselves in this game. And I thought Thanasis was was pretty good on this night. So uh, we have to shout out uh, him for sure. And he he does remind me. I mean, when I when I think about Thanasis or when I think about how people would generally respond to eating a built bar, I think of, you know, Thanasis. He's one of the first players I think of because that energy that he has, uh, you can tell that he's obviously he's, he's got good nutrition. I would suspect he probably eats Bilt Bar, the best tasting protein bar that's ever been made. Uh, did you know that Bilt Bar has nine delicious flavors? There is something for everyone. When you talk to a Bilt Bar fan, they're definitely passionate about their favorites. If you don't know the Bilt Bar flavors, well, you are simply missing out. There's coconut, cherry, barcia, raspberry, mint, brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, strawberry, cookies and cream. The list goes on and on. Uh, not only are Bilt Bars uh, tasty, but they're healthy too. Only 17 to 18 grams of protein. Calories ranging from 130 to 180, only 4 to 5 grams of sugar, 4 to 5 grams of net carbs. Uh, Built Bar is also the official protein bar of the U.S. track and field team. So just go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, if we're looking for... If we're looking for positives, uh, before I get to the positives, actually, I mentioned that, you know, we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen of every single day. Uh, when well, we know that it is your first listen of every single day. But uh, like I always mention, go back, check out our friends over at the Locked On Packers podcast, uh, Peter Bukowski out there. Maybe that can be your second listen of the day. The Packers are just, they're, they're just rolling at the moment. An upset win in Arizona the other days. Uh, Wisconsin sport teams can't, <laughs> just cannot stop beating Arizona. It's, uh, it's unbelievable right now. But one of the positives from tonight's game, Grayson Allen again. Nice back-to-back -back for him. 
you know, I think that this is a positive. When we talk about the three-point shooting, uh, Grayson Allen over the Spurs game and the Utah game, a 10 for 19 from three-point land. He was hovering in the low 30s. It was around 32%, 33% comes into this game, 10 three-pointers across the two games. Um, so for him, on this night against Utah, 18 points. He had six rebounds as well. Uh, five of his 10 three-point makes he knocked down. So Grayson Allen's been pretty good in double digits every single night. Uh, probably at the moment being asked to do a little bit more or they're, they're needing him to do a little bit more. He hasn't had a major breakout game yet, but he's been consistent. And he knocked down a couple of threes in this fourth quarter that had Dr. Dave up on his feet. Dr. Dave was ready to go. He was fired up uh, in this one. So Grayson Allen has been certainly a positive and, you know, he was talking about it after the game, the fact that he's only just come to this team and he's trying to, acclimatized to playing with these guys when they're in and out of the lineup constantly. So for him to be able to still play consistent like this, I think is impressive because we've seen with some other guys, Shemi Ojale for one, that has struggled. Ojale didn't play tonight, second night of a back-to-back. They sort of did the switcheroo. <clears throat> Bobby Portis came in uh, to the lineup. Ojale was out and uh, Bobby, six for 15 from the field. He had 15 points and five rebounds and was able to knock down a three. So he'd missed his three since he came back. He was only one for five, but good to see one go down at least for Bobby Portis there. So I, I don't know what's next for the Bucks. We're going to break it down more. Obviously, on tomorrow's show, we will discuss everything that's that's happened with the Bucks and what to expect moving forward into a Detroit game that, you know, quite honestly, the Bucks probably have to get. I mean, right now, when I sit here and I look at the standings, the Bucs are in 10th in the East, which is kind of weird. Playing team? Are the Bucs a playing team? So they were three and four. But there are some teams below them that are also struggling that you would expect to be better. Boston are two and four. Uh, Atlanta are at 500. They're three and three. Brooklyn, four and three as well. So obviously, it's way too early. Um, for those that follow Eric Name, he always posts these videos of Giannis and Chris Milton and, and the guys warming up before the game. And when I saw it this morning and he said, uh, game seven of 82, I really had to sit there and think, my goodness, this is going to be a long ass season. Particularly when you come off the championship, it's like getting worked up about game seven of the regular season just feels, feels like hard work, especially when you're watching the players that are out on the court. And by the way, before I, I sign off on this podcast and before I even think about signing off, I think I, I think I know another reason why Frank might have not have come on the podcast tonight. It was Justin Robinson, 24 minutes, nine points, three rebounds. He had a steal. He was four for seven from the field. He was defending Donovan freaking Mitchell for half of this game, which is just not fair. I would have liked to have heard Frank praise Justin Robinson a little bit for some of the things that he did in this game. He hit that that three that was ridiculous to beat the, the shot clock. I don't know how much he meant it. He hit it in front of Joe Ingles. Joe Ingles looked just this. He couldn't. He was beside himself that Robinson could even knock down this three. But Justin Robinson, I can't get off this podcast without giving him a little bit of praise. I thought he really battled hard. I mean, he's undersized. It's really tough for him defensively. But to have that assignment on Mitchell and then also hit some buckets and, and find a way to score a couple of times there, shout out to him. Shout out to Justin Robinson. I, I don't, you know, again, hopefully, no offense to him, but hopefully he's not playing big minutes in a little bit of time here when uh, hopefully we get some bodies back. But uh, for now, at least, I thought he was pretty good tonight. And I should acknowledge, I've been doing this media stuff for about three years now I've, since I, I quit my job and moved into sports media. And I, I always said to myself, you know, if, if you're going to do sports media, sometimes... Sometimes you'll be wrong or sometimes you'll miss a detail and that's totally fine. As long as you could admit that you missed a detail or you were wrong, then you know people, people will respect that. So I have to acknowledge, like one of my favorite TV shows, PTI, the errors or acknowledgements or whatever, whatever it is that they call it. On the last podcast, I did say, you know, Yorgos, uh, Kalazakis, you know, why, why wasn't he a two-way? We discussed it at length when he was signed to his deal, why he couldn't be a two-way as part of the the buyout, his international contract buyout, had to have a, a roster spot, not a not a two-way spot. So Frank was very, very quick and and probably very disappointed in me for not remembering that. Uh, but that's true. He couldn't actually be a two-way guy. Uh, it was also pointed out in the comments as well. So shout out to you guys for keeping me accountable. Someone's got to do it. Someone has to keep me accountable. But, uh, you know, uh, the point that I made about Kalazakis, like, should he really be on the roster? I mean, 
it kind of stands because tonight he was on the bench. Bucks have no one playing. He was still DMP. So, you know, I mean, you just don't know. It just feels like now when the Bucks could use a body or two, maybe that, that roster spot could have been uh, used elsewhere. But anyway, thanks again for keeping me accountable. Thanks to everyone for listening. Uh, thanks to all our friends all across the world, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in the US, whether you're in Greece, and you got the, the nicest podcast today. It was fantastic. We appreciate you listening. Before I sign off, if you play fantasy basketball, you want to check out the Locked On Fantasy Basketball podcast with my fellow Aussie, Josh Lloyd. Uh, that podcast just does ridiculous numbers, so make sure you go and check out the Locked On Fantasy Basketball podcast. But for now, I'll be back tomorrow with Camille Davis is going to be on the show. It's always awesome when Camille... Uh, joins me on Locked On Bucks. She is very knowledgeable and very good in front of the mic. She's a, a veteran podcaster. So Camille will be back. Some other fun stuff later in the week. So stay tuned for that. But for now, we're going to leave it there. The Bucks have lost three in a row. Pistons coming up in a couple of days. We'll catch you guys tomorrow.